Hello and welcome to Forbes India Path Breakers with me Neha Bothra. From making steering wheels to now emerging as one of the few global companies to have the expertise to design high-tech EV systems, we'll take you inside Sona Comstar story. Stay tuned to the conversation. Hi Sanjay, good to have you on the show. Thank you, good to be here. Jan 2008 was the year when you made some big ticket acquisitions to change the course of the business. That is when debt really came to bite the company and uh, the GFC also did not help matters. We had multiple businesses within uh, our auto component business in the family. Sonakoya was a listed company and I was running that uh, starting from 2008 because my father took over Sona BLW and we bought an asset in Germany uh, with three plants in Germany and one in the US in 2008, which mm -hmm. is um, part of what is today Sona Comstar, yeah. the Sona BLW business, which was a joint venture with Mitsubishi Materials. I don't think anyone could predict the financial crisis that we went through in 2008. And I think if you were sitting in 2006, 2007, you felt it was a 10 years of a great run. Uh, I don't think anyone could predict what would happen. Uh, with the Lehman crash. So in 2008, when we did the acquisition, we were uh, in a mode where we wanted to expand. We were, uh, I'd say, a little late in the M&A game uh, as far as the auto component industry was concerned. Back in 2000, 2003, 4, 5, a lot of auto component companies uh, made a lot of acquisitions. Some worked, some didn't. And uh, here was an opportunity for us to expand globally uh, in a product that we knew. So. Uh, yes, it was a leveraged buyout. We took a lot of debt uh, to buy that business. And then, of course, you know, the financial crisis came and, and things changed. But, you know, um, things have turned out pretty good uh, mm -hmm. since then. You exited the steering system business. Was that a move to bring the house back in order? So in 2017, uh, we exited the steering system business because, you know, as we increasingly moved into electronic power steering, uh, the technology and the product liability was with our joint venture partners. And I felt that uh, this business would do best if it were owned by the joint venture partners. We came to an agreement where, uh, you know, they decided to buy my stake. Uh, we own 25% of the business. We sold that to our, our joint venture partners, which was Koyo at that time, then now called JTEC. It was part of a restructuring exercise. The focus really was to increase our uh, footprint in the forging business because we owned the technology. Uh, and, you know, to give you an idea of that, even though we had a joint venture with Mitsubishi Materials, we very quickly learned the technology and uh, we had an opportunity then to buy Mitsubishi out. So whilst we sold our stake to a joint venture partner in one business, we bought back our stake from a joint venture partner in another business. So it was, mm -hmm. you know, pretty much in terms of how do we leverage the technology that we own and build on that technology. And that's the reason we looked at uh, you know, restructuring the business. Mm -hmm. This is after your father passed away, yeah. he set up the business. So when you took this bold step, what yeah. was guiding you apart from yeah. the metrics of the JV, of course? At that point, I was probably think thinking 10 to 15 years ahead. Today, I think 50 years ahead. The fact is that we knew we had a gold mine in terms of technology when it came to Sona BLW. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the technology we were sitting on in terms of bevel gears, in terms of warm forging, in terms of tool making, dye making, etc., was phenomenal. So, you know, we took this bold bet because we realized that, you know, if you own your technology, you can really play in the global market. Companies have started looking at market share from a global perspective. Yeah. The India market is still very small when it comes to value. Whilst we're the third largest market in the world when it comes to volume, in terms of value, we're, you know, about 2% of the world. So that's a very small value market. Mm -hmm. uh, so our endeavor was always to see how we can become a global player. How do you supply into a market of 20 million vehicles uh, as opposed to just 2 to 3 million vehicles? So tell me what was happening behind the scenes. 2019 was a definitive year for uh, the company. That is when Blackstone came on board. Uh, the merger with Comstar happened. Uh, tell us a bit about what some of these conversations were like. So we had a private equity investor uh, called GM Finance. Yeah. Uh, and they'd been with us for 10 years uh, and we had a great partnership with them. I still continue to have a great relationship with GM Finance. You know, it's time for them to exit. Uh, we didn't want to IPO. Uh, 
uh, we had a German asset which was debt heavy. We had an Indian asset uh, mm -hmm. which is Sona BLW, which was small in size compared to what it is today. However, it was a profitable entity. And then we had a US asset which, uh, you know, had lost a customer and therefore it was a loss making business. Uh, so we had to restructure the business and therefore we didn't feel it was time to IPO. Uh, so GM Finance and us had a, a very uh, sort of good conversation to say let's bring in another private equity investor. Uh, we did the rounds. We uh, were keen to go with a company like Blackstone and I'm glad Blackstone was keen to work with us. And that's how the relationship started. Uh, it took us almost a year to close that deal. Blackstone came in in 2019. And I think there was a lot of interesting stuff that happened at that point in time. We separated Germany from uh, the India company. Uh, we shut down the US operations and we moved all the operations to India. We had six forging press lines in, in the United States uh, and that capacity has never come back in the US. And uh, we continued to uh, or we moved the business to India and continued to supply from India uh, to our customers in the US which was a great decision you know, in hindsight. I think at that point in time, we didn't really have a choice. Uh, you know, the choice was to either sell the business uh, or continue as is uh, mm -hmm. or um, move it to India. In fact, at that time, we didn't have the money uh, to invest in terms of upgrading the equipment. So we moved the business to India. We then restructured the business in terms of even the management. And when Blackstone came in, I had the opportunity to move from manager to owner. Uh, so I actually removed myself from the operations of the business uh, and uh, we had Vivek who uh, was the CFO of the business and who was involved with me in mm -hmm. restructuring the entire uh, business and the entire operation of the business who was appointed CEO. And that's when we brought Comstar into the fold because Blackstone had acquired Comstar before they came into a partnership with us. So when they did that, we acquired Comstar from Blackstone and merge Comstar into um, Sona and that's how the birth of Sona Comstar from Sona BLW. I owned 65% of the business when it was Sona BLW. Blackstone came in and bought about 32% 30, from GM Finance and once we bought Comstar from them, they owned 65 and I owned 35. So it reversed and of course from an Indian context and an Indian auto Quite component, unheard of. Yeah, it was uh, unheard of. Uh, you know, because people get more concerned about controlling stake. However, you know, what I saw in it was, you know, we'll be able to build a business which will be much, much larger than it is today. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Blackstone brings a lot of credibility, uh, brings a lot of good financial strength, you know, and brings a lot of good uh, financial metrics, uh, mm -hmm. if, if you want to call it that, uh, has great experience in M&A, has great experience in taking to public markets. So while we had the technology uh, and the customer base, I think the right partnership was created with Blackstone having the financial strength. And, so was uh, it your decision to transition from a family business to a professionally managed company or was there some pressure from Blackstone to reduce your stake? So I think it was a, it was a good partnership and a conversation that we had with each other. And of course, I had with my wife, you know, I spent a year discussing this with her and with Vivek, who's my CEO. Uh, you know, in terms of what next, uh, you know, for me, uh, in terms of, you know, me moving from an operational role, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and again, professionalizing the business. But I studied a lot of companies in Europe and in the US in terms of longevity. And that's why when I said earlier today, I look at the business 50 years from, from now is because, you know, I'm in this business for the long term. Sure. Uh, and the way to build a business in the long term is to professionalize a business in the true sense as opposed to, you know, you being CEO and having managers report into you. And it's a decision that, uh, you know, was introduced to me by Blackstone, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think they put a lot of pressure on me. We came to a decision together uh, to say, let's uh, build a business that, you know, can go way beyond any of our lifetimes. And mm -hmm. uh, the way to do that is, you know, to truly professionalize a business. And mm -hmm. But still, business. was it easy to let go of some control? You know, it's never easy to let go of control, but it's 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 a transition. It's a period. How did you handle transition. that transition? I'd say that I've been fortunate that I'm busy in a lot of other things I do. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I have this uh, great passion for voluntary leadership. There's a lot of stuff that I do outside of the workplace, but I think for the benefit of the business and the greater good of all, it's a decision that uh, that I took that I feel has served me well. The company listed in 2021, Blackstone has exited. 
Could you describe what your role at Sona Comstar is now? I work uh, with the board. Mm -hmm. We uh, work with Vivek with the, and, and, the, and the rest of the management. We work with our investors to sure. see what our investors are looking at uh, or looking for mm -hmm. in uh, what the board can do. I still uh, spend a lot of time uh, in conversation with uh, Vivek and with the, with, the, with the senior management team. We do a lot of scenario building. We do a lot of looking at the future together. My interest is from a long-term perspective. You know, for me, I'll always be an owner of this business. Uh, you know, for me, I'll always have this business as a large part of our uh, sure. portfolio. Um, and I need to look at it from 50 years from now, 100 years from mm -hmm. now, you know, next generation, etc. My role is more in terms of guiding management, uh, in terms of where the, we should be going. Uh, I have the good fortune of spending a lot of time outside the business and therefore, you know, I'm exposed to a lot of what's going on in terms of trends, in terms of EV, in terms of, sure. you know, infrastructure with regard to EV, in terms of mobility. And if you look at the automotive industry today, we always refer to it as the mobility industry because it's transformed from just pure play automotive mm. to uh, mobility. And, I, and that's something that, uh, you know, I can bring back to the business, uh, you know, and and have that healthy discussion, uh, you know, with the management to say, look, you know, what's on their mind, what's on my mind, and how we can sort of, you know, uh, build build synergies uh, uh, together. Mm -hmm. As we were discussing, you mentioned that 2016 is when you saw the big opportunity in EV. What made you identify that and? bet on that at a time when people weren't willing to... So, you know, in 2016, um, <clears throat> I was in Germany uh, and we had an OEM come to us and ask us to design uh, the platform for electric vehicles. It's a very nascent stage and uh, a European OEM. And I thought to myself, I said, you know, here's an opportunity where the component industry is going to play a big role in designing for the OEMs because the OEMs mm -hmm. are so wedded to the combustion engine uh, that they'll continue to do the combustion engine whilst we'll have an option to design for EV. And that's really when we got into uh, designing for EV and we realized that the way forward would be EV. Uh, if you looked at all the trends in terms of sustainability, in terms of climate change, in terms of pollution, etc., everything was pointing in the direction of uh, us going electric or clean energy, whilst the industry resisted it because of the investments yeah. that had been made in uh, mm. in the engine technology and we were moving from BS4 to BS6, etc. I felt something in me. I had a gut instinct that, you know, we would go EV and the world would move towards electrification. And fortunately, it's played out right, you know, and, and I always say luck has a big role to play in a lot of the things that we do. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded of, uh, you know, a quote by uh, Henry Ford where he said, if I ask my customers what they want, they would say, I want faster horses. And I think <laughs> it's almost like, you know, you bringing to uh, the forefront what technologies will work uh, mm -hmm. in the future. What would you now say are some important trends that are shaping Indian market in the EV space? So I think uh, infrastructure development is going to be a big trend and something mm -hmm. that we require as we increase the number of EVs. Uh, and then if you look at uh, the automotive industry as a whole, if you look at connectivity, if you look at telematics, if you look at uh, data, all these uh, areas are going to play a big role in the automotive industry. So, you know, I'm, I'm often asked about the fact that, oh, you know, engines will go away. There's a large part of the component industry that will get impacted. I say, but you know, 40% of the vehicle is going to be software. So how do you pivot your business? I feel that uh, the opportunities uh, that exist in the auto component industry are very similar to what's happening in the West and the Far East. You will see more cars with, uh, you know, connectivity, with digitization or digitalization in India, uh, you know, ramping up. There'll be option for connectivity, there'll be option for cyber security, there'll be... So I'll give you an example. You know, we bought a company in Serbia very recently that does um, millimeter wave radar sensors. And what it does is it can read a heart rate and, a, and the breathing rate of a baby or an animal and the reason it does that is because there's a safety regulation in Europe mm -hmm. which demands if you want a five star rating that you should be able to determine if there's a baby or a pet locked in a stationary vehicle with all the windows up mm -hmm. because it can cause death. 
so within 10 seconds, the driver should be alerted. Now, we bought this business because we believe that regulations like this are going to drive change. And this is our entry into autonomous. Mm -hmm. So we're not only just betting on EV, but we're saying, okay, we're in EV. How do we go to autonomous now? Data analytics is something that's very big. If you look at a company like Mobileye, mm. which got bought for $15 billion by Intel, uh, you know, it essentially collects data mm. and feeds that data to governments or to other agencies that can use that data. So the other aspect is, what do we do with that data? You know, that's the other aspect. So again, I feel that there's going to be a lot of opportunities like this in the component space, uh, in the automotive industry. You know, there's no doubt that in the long term, the narrative is going to be safer, better, greener ways of mobility. But what about the near term and the medium term? We are already hearing a lot of uh, chatter uh, from OEMs about how they are not very excited about growth in the EV space. How are you looking yeah. into it considering that 80% is from the EV segment? Yeah. Even though there's been a s slight decline, we've still increased revenue in EV yeah. because of the mere fact that more companies are going EV. Uh, so, you know, whilst there is talk of, of there being a slowdown in EV, it's more so to do with the whole range anxiety aspect of it. And I think companies will examine hybrid, but eventually companies will go EV. And as infrastructure gets built out, I don't see how we won't go e uh, electric. You're absolutely right. From a short term, maybe there's a little bit of uh, you know fluctuation between EV and hybrid. But from a medium term, we will uh, see more uh, adoption of electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. You have your ears close to the ground. What are you picking up about the infrastructure development uh, with regard to the EV space in India? So I think it needs to happen much quicker than it is. There is a need for more charging stations. And I think we need to push that. And I think, again, you know, what we've noticed so far in the last few years, uh, public sector has put a lot of money into infrastructure. I think private sector needs to start making investments now. And, and, and I think we need to ramp up infrastructure when it comes to charging stations and EV infrastructure in general. We are seeing a lot of uncertainty around the fame subsidy. How do you view yeah, this? Let's see what happens uh, you know, going forward. PLI has been a game changer as well. In fact, you are the first mm -hmm. auto component maker to have a PLI certificate. Yeah, so we were the first uh, uh, from our motor division to get approval. Mm -hmm. uh, there are 66 or 67 companies that have been approved by from the auto component space. Uh, and yeah, you know, I, again, it's a learning process, uh, you know, for us uh, in the component industry, uh, for the government as well, for the ministry to understand, you know, how to uh, manage this uh, process of making sure that across the supply chain, you know, you are indigenizing or, or localizing. And it's a, it's a good effort. And I'm pretty certain that it will create a lot of benefits. And uh, it has been very encouraging in terms of the fact that they're encouraging you to invest in future technologies. And you definitely can get a benefit from it. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, with all that's happened with imports, etc., I think there's been, you know, a little bit of, I'd say, almost like a fear of, you know, is mm -hmm. this, uh, are, we, are we doing the right thing? And I think sure. it's an evolution. Uh, from my perspective, we're on the right track. Uh, and I'm certain that, you know, uh, the government will, will support us. Mm -hmm. How much incentive are you expecting to get under the PLI scheme? So I think it's, it's uh, I, I don't have the figure with me, but it's a significant uh, saving for us. You have 26 EV customers. We have over 30 uh, customers. How excited are they about the India opportunity? Yeah, we so keep I hearing th about Tesla wanting to come to India. Well, you know, I mean, I, I can't comment on OEMs, but I, th I feel that, you know, Every OEM that we've spoken to and every OEM that we work with is in some shape or form working in EV mm -hmm. because that is the future. I think the big uh, EV uh, makers in India are the two, -wheel two wheelers and the three wheelers. I think that's changing very rapidly and uh, you know, our motor division works with, you know, uh, with a lot of, uh, if not uh, most of the uh, EV uh, two and three wheeler uh, makers. Uh, and, and it, it's, it's, an, it's an exciting space. You've so how do you think um, a global competitor would have to say about Sona Comstar? Uh, our competitor? Yes. I think our competitor would be, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I hope our competitors are, uh, know where we're going. And uh, I hope that uh, uh, they're aware of the fact that, uh, you know, 
we're increasing business and increasing market share every day. And what do you feel about your competition? I think it's good. If you don't have competition, you can't build a business uh, and become globally competitive. I think our competition keeps us on our toes. So Chinese players, as we know, they have been scouting for global partners. In fact, you know, they want to have more of these tie-ups so that they can tighten the grip in the EV battery space. What are your views on that? So, um, I don't see many uh, uh, sort of opportunities for ourselves uh, in terms of joint venture partnerships because again, you know, we like to play in a space where we control and own our technologies. We may look at product specific joint venture partnerships, uh, you know, and we have looked at them, uh, not particularly in China, but uh, outside of China. And let's see what happens uh, going forward. But yes, China is playing a big role in EV. You can't ignore China. You also have manufacturing plants in China. Yeah, so we do that because we have local customers and for the local customers we manufacture, we assemble there okay. more than manufacture. Mm -hmm. So we've got a few local customers and we assemble in China. So is there a preference for many of these companies to have local facilities? Sometimes, uh, sometimes companies require it, uh, you know, and uh, because sometimes tariffs can force you uh, to be in local countries. Uh, and what they call nearshoring, etc. Uh, and uh, you know, we prefer manufacturing in India, mm -hmm. no doubt. Uh, you know, India's uh, destination of choice for us because we are an Indian company uh, that supplies globally. I mean, you know, uh, so we will continue to expand our footprint in India. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, there will be times when we're required to. We have two plants in Mexico. Uh, you know, if we are required to be closer to a customer that's present in Mexico, you know, we, we have the ability to do that. 70% mm -hmm. of your sales are uh, from Western countries, right? From outside of India, yeah. So what percentage would be produced in India? I'd say predominantly almost uh, a majority of our production is in India. I'd say 90% of our production is in India. We do some amount of assembly outside of India, but uh, almost all our production is from India. Our but you invested course. quite a bit, right, uh, in many of these plants, like the recent Mexico plant. I mean, we've invested in terms of we've set up facility because if we ever need to. So we have uh, manufacturing, uh, sorry, assembly in uh, in our motor division already in Mexico. We have a plant that we've uh, constructed in uh, for our driveline business and uh, we'll service our customers from there. We'll service our customers that are based in Mexico uh, from the Mexican plant. Mm -hmm. You have manufacturing facilities in India, Mexico, China, US. Uh, what are some differences you note in terms of the ease of doing business? We are most accustomed to doing business in India, right? And, uh, and we enjoy manufacturing. We like manufacturing here. In fact, one of the big challenges we have in Mexico is people. Uh, you know, uh, people leave without any notice. Really? Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, it's not an easy environment. Uh, to hold on to people because industry is growing there and it definitely becomes a challenge. But our plan is really to continue to increase our footprint in India because we've been fortunate enough to uh, have had a good run. We've been able to put up plants in record time. Uh, you know, we have the right talent pool available. And you know, with the growing uh, demand in terms of EV with the a change or the disruption in the auto component industry or the automotive industry, I want to say, mm -hmm. uh, we've also had the opportunity to recruit good talent. Uh, so whilst, you know, talent is a challenge across the board, uh, you know, we've had a good run in India and we're pretty uh, happy with the way uh, things have panned out for us. I'm very curious to know this, uh, considering the equations between India and China, how easy is it to have a facility in China and also do business out of there? There is uh, a, a certain amount of, uh, you know, I mean, local presence you require in China. Uh, and uh, we have that and we bank on, on, on that. Uh, our business with China, again, in terms of size is still very small. Uh, our majority of our business is with the US, followed mm -hmm. by India and Europe, which is uh, pretty much the same. And, and, and Asia is about 6% of our revenue. Uh, so I'd say China is a small percentage of that. Uh, so it's not, it's not so much of a challenge right now because it's not that large uh, in terms of uh, value. What are you picking up on the demand front? Uh, we have had headwinds and we have been talking about a global slowdown. Yeah. So what has the impact our, our, been? Our, our business is, is, our industry is cyclical. Uh, and, you know, we've had a few years of good growth. Uh, we could see uh, some, uh, you know, uh, decline. However, at the moment, we've seen a positive trend. 
uh, and we hope that that trend continues. Mm -hmm. You know, there's always talk about recessions in the U.S., yeah. et cetera, et cetera. But you know, we haven't really seen anything drastic at the moment. Uh, so we hope that this uh, positive trend continues. And you know, again, it's a cyclical industry, sure. uh, and uh, you know, our management's role is to ride out that cycle. And so, which geographies are driving demand at present? Europe, I heard, mm -hmm. is pretty robust. It's picked up a bit. Yeah, but Europe's picked up. The U.S. is picked up. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, India's uh, also done well. So I was told that you enjoy playing polo and that is something that inspires your leadership style. How would you describe your leadership style? I think uh, uh, I, I'm a team player. I have a great uh, sort of uh, respect for the team that, uh, that we have uh, at Sona. Uh, and uh, I like working in a collaborative mode. That's not to say that we don't have our fair share of arguments. Having enough dispute and then coming to uh, some sort of agreement is also good because it brings different perspectives to the table. Uh, but again, I think then once as an organization we make a decision uh, and we should all back that decision and, and move forward. Uh, so I like to um, believe that, uh, that the people around me are you know, super intelligent and I like to surround myself with really people as smarter than I am. And the aim is really you know, to build something that we can compare to any global company. Mm. So are you investing in startups? Uh, personally, yes. We have a family office and I do invest in startups. We invest in startups in the clean tech space, in micro mobility. Uh, we've invested in startups which are again uh, in, in areas where we feel we can mostly add value or we see an opportunity that you know, is good from a environment perspective. So, so we have we have a, a family office that, that does invest. How are you experimenting with artificial intelligence? And I mean, not at mm -hmm. Sona Comstar, but uh, at home. I'll tell you the the most interesting concept that I find about AI is the fact that we can live forever. Because if I were to capture all the data in terms of everything that I've ever said, take this interview for example, and everything that I have written and everything that I've said, and put it into uh, uh, an AI engine, <clears throat> you know, my kids or my kids' kids, even when I'm not alive, could ask me questions and I'd probably answer them in the way that I had answered through AI. So I think AI is going to play a big role <clears throat> in all our lives. I've seen people design entire homes by giving specifications in terms of what kind of <clears throat> space they want to build. So we need to do a few things. One is we need to, I think, learn prompt engineering mm -hmm. because prompts are really what will determine the successful use of AI. And two, I think we need to uh, adapt to AI uh, because it's a thing of the future. If you could go back in time, yeah. is there anything that you'd want to do differently? Professional, personal? No, I think, you know, um, things worked out well. I mean, it's often you regret the things you didn't do as opposed to the things you did. Mm -hmm. Yes, we've had our share of ups and downs. And I don't think I would have enjoyed the successes if I didn't have the failures.